What's going on everybody? Welcome to another episode of Mid-Season Evaluation. In this installment, I'll be taking a look at the Dallas Fuel and the Los Angeles Gladiators. As usual, I'll be giving an honest opinion and review on how both of these teams have played through their first 14 games of the 2019 Overwatch League season. I like to start with the team who is lower in the standings for those of you who weren't already aware, which means that the Fuel are going to be up first. After one half of play, the Dallas Fuel have a 9-5 record with a plus 5 map differential. This puts them at 6th place in the overall standings, which means that they would be guaranteed to make the end of year playoffs if it started today. For those of you who don't know, the top six teams in the league are the ones to secure spots in the postseason automatically. Dallas has done well through their 2019 journey so far, but how exactly did they put themselves in such a good position? Let's find out by first reviewing their offseason then going from there. After a pretty disappointing 2018 campaign, the Fuel were set to make things right for their fans in 2019. Unfortunately for the Fuel, they would have to carry out this goal without their veteran and one of their best players in Siegel. After Season 1 ended, he decided to retire from Pro Overwatch due to stress and having the desire to be a full-time streamer. Siegel definitely left a big hole both in terms of D.Va and Flex DPS play. Dallas decided to address these issues by first signing RCK who previously played some D.Va and DPS for Team Giganti. They also attempted to address their Flex DPS problem by signing Zachary from Fusion University. I was all for the RCK signing, but the Zachary pickup was a little bit of a head scratcher. Zach was known for his Tracer, Sombra, and Widow while playing in Contenders, and sadly the Fuel already had plenty of good hits game players on their roster. What the Fuel really needed was someone who could play Projectile. I thought that Zachary had the potential to be a good player, but I thought it would take some time, especially after his dreadful performance in the 2018 World Cup for Team USA. Which means that Coach Arrow probably saw something in him that the rest of us couldn't, since he did coach him during the World Cup after all. The final roster addition Dallas would make before stage 1 got underway was the addition of Closer who formerly played on the London Spitfire. Now this was a move I could get behind. Closer would most definitely be a nice upgrade on the main support slot over Harry Hook. To round out their offseason, the Fuel also transitioned Coco into a coaching role and decided to part ways with Chip Zion. With their new roster complete, the Fuel were set to take on the San Francisco Shock in their first game of 2019, and boy did things go wrong for them in this one. Not only did Dallas lose this game, but they lost hard. Nothing screams disappointing like a 4-0 loss to start the stage. But then the Fuel made it clear that this was not yet time to be concerned, as they then beat the new and improved Soul Dynasty convincingly in the same week. However, yet again in week 2 we would see more of the same from them. They started by getting destroyed 4-0, but then got a clutch win over the Fusion. It is worth noting that Boombox was not playing, but it's still a quality win against a decent team regardless. After a very strange 2-2 start, I was starting to feel concerned about the Fuel. They were the definition of inconsistent. In their wins they dominated, but they also looked horrible in their losses. If Dallas wanted to prove they were a playoff caliber team, then they would have to show more consistent results. One problem I think Dallas was suffering from early on was their lack of a good Zarya. The team was still trying to figure out if Effect or AKM was the better option at the time, and it wasn't until his big game against the Fusion that the Dallas coaching staff finally came to the realization that starting AKM from here on out was the right way to go. In the next few weeks, I really wanted to see Dallas either go on a win streak or lose games in closer fashion, and the field decided to do the first thing by beating the Dragons two games in a row to propel their record to 4-2. Although their record was decent, their map differential on the other hand was not looking very pretty due to their blowout losses. The Fuel's playoff hopes were still alive, but they had to beat the Boston Uprising to finish 5-2 if they wanted to get in. And things started off as well as you'd hope they would if you're a Dallas fan. The match appeared to be over at halftime when the Fuel took a commanding 2-0 lead, and just when I thought this team had finally become consistent, they proved to me that they still had some improving to do after getting reverse swept. The Fuel would go 4-3 because of this heartbreaking loss and would miss the stage playoffs as a result. The Fuel decided that it would be in their best interest to make a change coming into stage 2. Just days before it got started, RCK was traded to the Boston Uprising in return for no. I for one was a big fan of this move. No disrespect to RCK, he's a phenomenal diva and his Sombra's pretty good as well. Note in my opinion is just better though, he has been one of the most consistent diva players in the league since 2018. This trade told me that Dallas cared a bit more about having a good diva and that they didn't value RCK Sombra all that much. Plus AKM and Zachary are pretty good on her so you can still run Sombra without too much of an issue if you choose to utilize her in your comps. While this isn't quite as important, the Dallas Fuel also made two coaching staff changes before the stage started as well. First they said goodbye to Coco as he decided to fully retire from Pro Overwatch, and just one day later, the Fuel announced that they hired the Paris Eternals former head coach Damon as their tank coach. Coming into week 1 of stage 2, the Fuel actually had no games to play so they would have to edge over their week 2 opponents since they would have an extra week of prep time for them, and while they didn't have any games, the Fuel still found a way to be relevant during week 1. On April 6th, 
the DPS legend effect announced his retirement from Pro Overwatch on his Facebook account. In his long and emotional post, he mentioned how the game was no longer fun anymore, and how he wanted to seek help from a doctor to help with mental issues he's been facing. While Effect never really had a place in the GOATS meta, he would surely be missed if DPS ever came back. But anyway, as mentioned earlier, the fuel at the first week of stage went off, so they had extra rest and preparation for the Toronto Defiant and Paris Eternal. Dallas really seemed to take advantage of this extra edge by playing fairly well in two wins to start their stage. Dallas getting an extra week off was a blessing, but also a curse at the same time. Because they had only played two games so far, they would be forced to play six games in the next three weeks. It also doesn't help that they had the unfortunate pleasure of playing Vancouver and Seoul back to back in week three. Just like with stage one, the Fuel were showing mixed results. They looked good in their wins, but lost in their defeats. Luckily for the Fuel, these would be the toughest games of their stage. Next up on their schedule was the Valiant and the Outlaws during the Dallas homestand weekend. The Fuel fed off of the energy from their home crowd to beat both of their opponents convincingly. OGE, AKM, and Uncle in particular had themselves a fantastic weekend. Now at 4-2, and two, the Fuel were starting to get the feeling of deja vu. Once again, a potential playoff berth would be on the line in their final matchup of the stage, but this time it was against the Mayhem. But, at least the Fuel didn't waste their opportunity that was given to them this time. There was no choking to be seen as Dallas finished with a 5-2 record, allowing them to make the playoffs. It's actually insane how similar stages 1 and 2 have gone for Dallas. In both, they had some major ups and downs, and their dreams of making playoffs were on the line in a Week 5 showdown. It was good to see the Fuel make the playoffs, but a Round 1 matchup against the Vancouver Titans destroyed any hopes of making a deep run as they went on to lose the Series 3-0. And that's how the Fuel have gotten to where they are right now. At 9-5, their chances of at least making the end-of-year play-in tournament are pretty high, so long as they don't lose a lot of their future games. They could even make playoffs without going through the play-in tournament if they play well enough. If I were to give a grade for the Fuel's midseason performance, then I would have to give them a B+. The team had their ups and downs, but their solid record means they most certainly had a lot more ups. It was tempting to give the Fuel an even higher grade because of how well they've done so far, but their early stage struggles and choking away a playoff berth in reverse sweep fashion kept me from doing so. There's also the fact that this team just seems to crumble against solid competition. Even so, Dallas has looked fairly strong through 14 games, and they appear to be a playoff contender. I'm excited to see what comes next for them. Now let us move on to the Gladiators. They also happen to be 9-5, but their superior map differential puts them slightly ahead of the fuel at 5th place. The Gladiators appear to be in an excellent spot. Not only have they been winning games, but they put themselves in a favorable position to make the end of the year playoffs. Let's find out why the Gladiators have been so successful starting with how their offseason went. After getting stunned by the Spitfire in the first round of the playoffs, the Gladiators had plans to alter their roster on the horizon. They started by letting Asher and Silk Thread walk in free agency. They also decided to part ways with iRemix since he was clearly not fit to be a starting main tank in the Overwatch League. Then of course there's the elephant in the room. The decision to transfer Fissure to the Soul Dynasty was sad, but also not surprising at the same time. Yes, Fissure helped transform the Gladiators into a title contender, but with him being benched for iRemix at the start of the postseason, we all knew that something must have gone horribly wrong. It was very obvious that the relationship between Fissure and the Gladiators had turned sour, and with Fissure making it clear that he wanted to play on a full Korean team, sending him to Seoul who were in desperate need of a main tank was a no-brainer. Now the Gladiators needed a new main tank, and what better way to fill out the position than to sign the superstar caliber player Roar from Kongdu Panthera? As a bonus, the Gladiators even gained some extra firepower on DPS by signing Roar's teammate Decay. It's rumored that the bidding war for Decay was pretty crazy, so the Gladiators must have paid a fortune to get him. The team finished their offseason by signing the Finnish flex support player Ripple from Team Giganti and giving the current LA Gladiators Legion main tank player Panker a two-way contract. Sure, the Gladiators lost Fissure, but they appeared to get two players with high ceilings in return. If Roar and Decay could play how they did on Kongdu Panthera and speak good English, then this team could be a major threat to the rest of the league. The potential was there. Now it was a matter of whether or not they could execute. One thing worth noting about Decay is that he was still under 18 years old at the start of the year, so he wouldn't be eligible to play till after his birthday, which meant that we wouldn't see him until week 3 at the earliest. The Gladiators wouldn't just be without Decay though. Although we wouldn't find out until a little bit later, Bishu would also be watching from the sidelines due to a chronic illness he's been battling called ulcerative colitis. Let me explain what this is if you've never heard of it before. The basic definition of it is that it's an inflammatory bowel disease that causes inflammation in the digestive tract. This illness would keep Bishu from playing at all during the first half of the year. While Void has proven to be a very good flex tank, Bishu would most certainly be missed for the sake of being a translator. He did it for Fissure last year, and I'm sure that doing it for Roar and Decay definitely would have been a big help until the two of them felt more comfortable speaking English. Even with this all in mind, I had reasonably high expectations for the Gladiators. Coming into Stage 1, their first match would be against the Soul Dynasty. A revenge and bragging rights game was on the line here. If the Gladiators could beat Fissure and his new team, then they could laugh at him for wanting to leave, and would make it very clear that they were not missing him now that they had Roar. Two bad things didn't work out like that though. Soul would win this game 3-1. 
This game was relatively close, but Roar seemed to have some onstage nerves in his first game. But perhaps it was just a slow start or something, because the Gladiators came back with a vengeance by winning their next game against the Shock 3-2. After a roller coaster week one, the Gladiators then lost to the Paris Eternal. Sure, this team started off the year kind of rough, but now we would finally get to see what Takei was made of in his Overwatch League debut against the London Spitfire. But even that wasn't enough to help the Gladiators get back in the win column. I think I can speak for most people when I say that the Gladiators appeared to be uncomfortable on GOATs. In particular, it felt like Roar, Surefort, and Hydration were having a hard time. Roar was kind of feeding at times, Surefort's damage output and death rate were not the best while he was on Zarya duty, and Hydration tended to be over aggressive on Brigida. The Gladiators had some problems that needed to be worked out. They were 1 and 4. Hopefully they could end their stage on a good note and show some improvement. And that is exactly what they ended up doing. In their final two games against the Rain and Charge, they got big wins against both of them. The Gladiators showed major improvement. Decay appeared to be a major upgrade on Zarya over Surefour, Roar seemed to be feeding less and making some big plays for the rest of his team, and Hydration was playing smarter overall. And let's not forget about the rest of their team. Big Goose and Chess looked as consistent as ever. And then there's Void. I feel like people were not talking about him enough. He, in my opinion, has been arguably the most consistent player on his team. I always thought that Void was an incredible player, but it almost felt like he wasn't super comfortable when he was picked up late last year. 2019 has been a different story, however. Void seems to be gelling together with his team extremely well. I don't know if it's because he improved his English or if he fixed some in-game mistakes, but whatever he's doing is working wonders right now. Although the Gladiators disappointed me by missing out on the playoffs, they ended stage one on a very strong note for me. If this was the team I was going to see moving forward, then I was all for it. This version of them could give just about anybody in the league problems. I would say they did a very good job of keeping up those momentum coming into the next stage, too. They started by getting quality wins over the Dragons and Dynasty, but they were far from done. In fact, they were just getting started. Winning their next four games after week one is proof of this. If you count the final two matches from stage one, then they were on an eight-game winning streak. The only team who had a larger streak at the time was the Titans. The Gladiators were finally starting to come into their own. Their potential was finally being shown to the rest of the world. Since they had such a strong stage two, they clinched a playoff berth before week five. But before they could prepare for the playoffs, they had to play their Week 5 matchup against the Boston Uprising. If they won this game, then they would also clinch an undefeated stage. And with Boston having a rough last couple of weeks, things were looking pretty good. Well, that's what I thought at least. The Gladiators actually ended up losing this game pretty badly. But even so, a 6-1 stage still got them the 4 seed in the playoffs. The bad news for the Gladiators though was that the NYXL finished in 5th. Their path to a stage championship was going to be absolutely brutal if they had to play arguably the third best team in the league during round 1. Even if they won this game, they would still have to go through the Titans and the Shock. While I didn't think they'd beat the NYXL, I expected the Gladiators to put up a good fight with how much New York had been struggling as of late. And oh boy did I drop the ball on that prediction. The Gladiators got clapped 3-0, ending their playoff run before it could even begin. Sure, the Gladiators were unable to make any noise in the playoffs, but their 6-1 stage made me take them a lot more seriously than in Stage 1. They were finally the team I'd envisioned watching. While I do think the Gladiators have done well so far, their Stage 1 was underwhelming at best which is why I've decided to give them a B plus as their midseason grade. While I think the team has done a good job overall of meeting expectations, I just can't overlook their stage one performance and their failure to even look competitive in the one playoff game they've been in. I know some people will say that I'm being too hard on them, especially because they weren't at full strength at the beginning of the year, but I'm a tough grader. I have high expectations for these guys, and I was hoping to see a bit more from them in the first half of the year, but it's okay. I get the feeling that the Gladiators will continue to look strong and improve even further during stages three and four. Their talent has so much potential. This especially goes for Roar and Decay, who could very well be league superstars in the foreseeable future. And I think that's basically everything I wanted to cover about the Gladiator. So with that being said, that is going to wrap up today's episode of Midseason Evaluation. What did you guys think of my reviews for each of these teams? Make sure to tell me down in the comment section and feel free to leave your own grades for them as well. If you enjoyed today's content, then be sure to like and subscribe. As always, thank you all so much for watching today's video. And until next time, this is ATP signing out. See ya.